morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me today to introduce Aaron Greenberg. Thanks to Jason. Okay, my second place of operation. So uh, I know uh, Aaron from, you know, very well from how he helps us in the beam line. I mean, this is a really great help and very useful, but I mean, he has another side. He is a bright young scientist and uh, who is working in something which we are very close to many of us, what we're working on now. I mean, it's uh, on uh, spin transition and iron, for example. And so I invited him to, to give a talk today. So about uh, his uh, background, I mean, he is, uh, he earned his PhD in condensed matter physics in Tel Aviv University, focusing on uh, pressure-induced electronic and structural transition in iron oxides. And in 2009, he uh, was a, a Marie Curie short-term uh, fellow in Bayerisch uh, Geo Institute in Germany in Bayreuth. And since that time, he moved to um, J.C. Cars and University of Chicago. And he, today, he's going to talk about pressure-induced electronic uh, transition on iron oxides. Welcome. OK, thank you, Alex. And thank you for inviting me to speak here. And as Alex said, I'm talking about pressure-induced electronic and magnetic transitions in uh, iron oxides. And I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what it means uh, mass transition and a high spin to low spin transition in these systems. And then I'm going to talk about beyond that, how it becomes more complex in real materials. So I'll give this introduction about electronic transitions. I'll talk about the experimental techniques that I have used. And then I'll give sort of a comparison between a mass transition and a high spin, low spin transition when using those techniques that I am familiar with. Uh, I will talk about a few more complex examples like a series of electronic transitions, multi-stage transitions and the relation to the crystal structure, and uh, one final example about a sluggish transition. So the difficulty with transition metal compounds is that both ionic models and band theory fail in describing the D states of the transition metals. And what Hubbard came up with was this interaction Hamiltonian, which includes a kinetic term for is called the hopping integral. And this uh, interatomic interaction potential, which is basically a Coulomb repulsion, uh, but only on the same site. So usually u is larger than t, and what we typically get is an antiferromagnetic insulator. And what's important to notice is that the gap is not related to magnetic ordering. It's only on the existence of magnetic moment, local magnetic moment, because this uh, intraatomic interaction is only on the same site. And another thing we should notice is that the gap can either close by reducing u somehow or by increasing the bandwidth, which is related to the kinetic term. Another energy scale we need to take into consideration is the crystal field splitting. And I'm giving here an example for iron 3 plus because all the samples I'm showing here are, uh, contain iron 3 plus. And if we just had this iron 3 plus sitting in nowhere, then we'd have the 10 3D levels, and I separated them by spin direction and a bit in the vertical direction just so we can count them easily, but they're all at the same energy, of course. When we put them in surrounding oxygens, for instance, in this case, I have six oxygens creating an octahedron, then we have what is called the crystal field, and in this case, it's an octahedral field, which creates six P2G levels and four EG levels. And then we need, need to take into consideration again U from the previous slide, the Coulomb repulsion. So we have two possibilities. If U is larger than the crystal field, then these P2G levels will be above the EG levels, essentially. Uh, and when we start placing our uh, electrons in the spin configurations, we fill out these three P2G levels and then two EG levels. And therefore, we have five unpaired electrons. And we have spin equals 5 halves. The other case is if u is smaller than the crystal field, then we start filling the electrons, and we get the spins, and we get 3 here and 2 here, all of them in the P2G. And we only have one unpaired spin 
So we have spin equals one half. And of course, we, most uh, samples we deal with are naturally in a high spin uh, configuration and ambient conditions. But when we apply pressure, we are distorting this octahedron and we might change the crystal field and we might increase it enough to reach a low spin state. Now a bit about the mod transition. Here we have, we see the P, uh, P level of the oxygen and the D state <coughs> of the transition metal. And as I said, we have this interatomic interaction which splits this D level into two levels. And then we have one of them is completely filled, one is completely empty, and we have this gas <coughs> U. Now when we apply pressure, we broaden uh, these two bands and at some point we have an overlap. So we no, no longer have localized electrons or non-localized. We have a collapse of magnetic moment and we have an insulator to metal transition. That's basically, in most basic terms, what a mod transition is. So the pressure can increase both the bandwidth and the crystal field. So we can either have a high spin to low spin transition or a mod transition. So we want to know what is the case for each of our samples. We want to know if all the iron in the system undergoes this transition. And we want to know how this relates to the crystal structure. Now, the experimental techniques I used are diamond anvil saw for applying the pressure on the samples. I used a few pressure calibrants depending on which measurement I'm using. Uh, pressure medium, of course, we want to get uh, good hydrostatic conditions. So when we could, we used pressurized neon or helium gases. When we weren't able to, we did cryogenic loading of nitrogen or argon. And in cases such as uh, resistance measurements, we, were, we had to use a solid uh, pressure medium. Uh, the experiments I ran are iron 57 moose bar spectroscopy, mostly in-house at Tel Aviv University, from about 4 Kelvin using liquid helium in a cryostat to room temperature. I did do a few synchrotron experiments where we can go even a bit below 4 Kelvin, down to 2.5 Kelvin, 2.4 Kelvin. And those are much faster measurements, and, uh, but we didn't get a lot of beam time there. Synchrotron X-ray diffraction, for that we got a lot of beam time, so I can show a lot of X-ray diffraction measurements. That was before I became a postdoc at uh, GSC cars where X-ray diffraction is what I do mostly now. <laughs> Electrical resistance measurements, also in-house, also between liquid helium temperatures and room temperature. Just for those of you who are not aware of what a diamond anvil cell is, we have the cell itself. We have two opposing diamonds, and we use screws to press these diamonds together. Because we have a large surface called the table of about three millimeters, and this a uh, small surface called the culet, which is usually in my experiments was between 150 and 300 microns. Because of this ratio of areas with a moderate force on the screws, we can create very high pressures on the sample here. I typically use the rhenium gasket, which is important for moose bar spectroscopy mostly, uh, because it blocks the background from the, uh, the background radiation from reaching uh, around the sample to the detector. And we have the sample chamber here with the pressure calibrant and the sample itself. These are the diamond anvil cells I used in Tel Aviv University. And one thing you can notice is that they're pretty small, about 22 millimeters in diameter and 15 to 30 millimeters in height. And that is because I was using a cryostat for the moose bar experiment. And we couldn't use a very large diamond anvil cell uh, otherwise, we'd have to waste a lot of liquid helium, which is pretty expensive. This is an example of how I performed uh, electrical resistance measurements. Uh, what we see here, this empty space is the sample chamber, and this black area is the sample itself. But everything is filled with this transparent aluminum oxide sodium chloride mixture as an insulator. So the hole is filled with it, and this metal gasket is also covered with it. And above it, I have these platinum wires reaching the sample. I have two here and two others reaching those platinum wires. So it's essentially a quasi-four probe 
measurement. And I was doing the, obtaining the resistance as a function of pressure and temperature uh, at each point by creating a voltage as a function of uh, current. For most power spectroscopy, a uh, few words. Uh, what's important here is that the lifetime of most bar uh, stays for iron, from moving from the nuclear state of the first excited state to the ground state in the nucleus of iron, uh, has a very narrow line width, about 10 to the minus 9 electron volts. And that allows us to see very small, what are called hyperfine splittings, which are on the range of 10 to the, sev 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 8 electron volts. And this, this includes the isomer shift, which is related to the S electron density near the nucleus. It has, includes the quadruple splitting, which is related to the splitting of the first excited state due to the surrounding electrons. Um, sorry, let me shrink a bit. <coughs> So if the surrounding electrons are uh, a bit inhomogeneous in their, oops, sorry, then we expect this first excited state to be split and we would see two absorption lines. And if we have magnetic ordering, we accept the expect the first excited state to be split into four states and the ground state into two. And we essentially have eight possible transitions, but only six of them are allowed. So we see this nice sextet when we have magnetic ordering, and this is due to the Zeeman splitting. Now, in order to scan this range of energies, we use, we just move our point source, and using this Doppler effect, we can scan the whole energy range. It's easy to scan a range of 10 to the minus 7 electron volts, so we can see all these different splittings. And what happens is most of the energies just pass through and reach our detector. But at certain energies which coincide with the nuclear transitions, we have an absorption, and then it's emitted in all directions, so we expect to see less counts at those energies. Okay, now a comparison between the MOT transition and the high spin, low spin transition. Um, I'm giving here two examples. On the left, I have a MOT transition of gallium iron oxide. On the right, high spin, low spin transition of iron oxyhydroxide or goatite. And this is using X-ray diffraction. And of course, from X-ray diffraction, I can't know if my transition is a high spin, low spin, or a mod transition. But at least I know that there is an electronic transition, and it's worth uh, using uh, my other methods of studying this sample. So in both of these cases, if you look, if we start from this one, we see that we have a unit cell volume as a function of pressure. We suddenly have a drop in the unit cell volume with no change in the, cr in the crystal symmetry. So we know that there is an electronic transition because there is no change in the electronic, in the, in the, uh, sorry, in the, in the symmetry, in the crystal symmetry, but we do see a change in volume. On the left here, we can ignore these dots, but if we look at this green, and then we uh, reach here and we see another, again, a drop in the unit cell volume. Then we know again that we have an electronic transition there because again, there is no change in spin symmetry between these two states. So for both cases in our comparison, we see a drop in unit cell volume and also in the polyhedral volume. For resistance, of course, we can know if there's a MOT transition or not. So for gallium iron oxide, we see that there is a drop in the room temperature resistance as a function of uh, pressure. But if we look in the inset, we can see that uh, the dr over dt uh, changes sign. So we have a change in the sign of the slope at about 68 gigapascals. So we know that there is a transition from an uh, insulating state to a metallic state. On the other hand, in this case of iron oxyhydroxide, we also see this drop in the room temperature resistance, but we don't see a change in dr over dt. It remains negative. So we know that there is no insulator metal transition, so it can't be a MOT transition there. So in our comparison, both cases we have a drop in the room temperature resistance, but for an insulator metal transition, we have to have a change in sign of dr over dt. And now on to Moosebauer spectroscopy. Uh, we can start out here on the right 
for iron oxyhydroxide. And at ambient conditions, this is zero GPA and room temperature, we see this magnetic sextet. So if we see a sextet, we know that we have magnetic ordering. And if we have magnetic ordering, of course, we have local magnetic moment. When we apply pressure, we see that this sextet is replaced by a doublet. So we know that there's no magnetic ordering anymore. But what does it tell us about the local magnetic moment? We are not sure because this is at room temperature. We have to go down to low temperatures to make sure about that. Before I go do that, I'll show uh, another problem with doing room temperature most power is that in this case, in gallium iron oxide, even at low pressures, we don't know what we have. It looks like we see a doublet, but we, we don't know. It should be high spin, but because this is room temperature, we don't have any proof of it, even at low pressures. And at high pressures, it also looks like a doublet. It looks like it changed, actually. It's a bit broader. It's a bit uh, wider, the separation. But we have to look at low temperatures to really understand what's going on in both of these cases. So here's the low temperature spectra. Again, I'll start out on the right. So for iron oxyhydroxide, at low pressures, we saw that it was uh, high spin at uh, low pressures. So we don't need to look at low temperatures for low pressures. But at high pressures, we do need to look at low temperatures. So we started out at 75 gigapascals and close to room temperature, we have this doublet. We cool it down, and we see ha we have this small splitting. So this tells us that we have ordering, but with a very small hyperfine field. We don't get this full sextet. We have something much smaller. And this is one manifestation of a high spin to low spin transition, where you have a very small hyperfine field because you have only spin half instead of spin five halves. On the left here for gallium iron oxide, so we see that at low pressures, we have the sextet at low temperatures because it's high spin. When we compress it, we see that it's replaced by a doublet. And even at very low temperatures, it remains a doublet. And that means that there is no magnetic ordering. And because it's at low temperatures, there is actually no magnetic correlation at all. So there's, uh, it means it agrees well with the fact that we saw an uh, insulator metal transition from resistance measurement. So for a metal transition, there's no sign of magnetic correlations at low temperature because of the non-locality of the electrons. And for a high spin, low spin transition, we have a smaller net magnetic moment for atom, at least for iron 3 plus, because it has this spin half even in the low spin state. And we have a much lower ordering temperature, as we saw. Now let's look at a few more complicated uh, scenarios from the literature. For instance, bismuth iron oxide by Gavrilouk et al. And they did this nuclear forward scattering, which is pretty similar to most power spectroscopy. And they did resistance measurements. And what they observed here is that they see a change from these uh, spectra that have a lot of beats, which is typical for high spin, into a spectra that has just this one beat, which is typical for uh, low spin. And then they have a further change, which they say is typical for uh, metallic state. And then they show the same thing from the resistance measurements, that only at the higher pressures, uh, above, above this 52 gigapascals, they see a change in slope of dr over dt, whereas the drop in resistance happened before that. And the change here to a low spin state happened before that. So they see a low spin state uh, at about 50 gigapascals. And only above 52, they see this insulator metal transition. So this, is a, this was a high spin, low spin, followed by an insulator metal transition. And it makes sense because the high spin to low spin will uh, reduce the gap, typically. Now, is this another example of a high spin, low spin transition, calcium iron oxide? Well, according to Merlini et al., they see this from single crystal x-ray diffraction. They see this drop in unit cell volume, a pretty large drop of about 8.4%. And they see a change in polyhedral volume, of course, and in the iron-oxygen average distances. And then they did X-ray emission spectroscopy. And they say that this satellite peak here drops. And then they claim that this is a high spin to low spin transition. But when I saw this, it looked to me that like it completely disappeared and not just became much smaller. And I thought, maybe it's a mod transition. So I did my own measurement. I did Raman measurement, for starters. And we can see that about 50 gigapascals, suddenly all these peaks sort of disappear. 
And I thought, okay, maybe there's some problem with my experiment, maybe the diamonds, maybe the sample. So I started decompressing and then they came back. So I understood that this has some physical meaning that I lost all my peaks here at 50 gigapascals. <coughs> and this, <coughs> because Merlini et al. reported that there's no change in the crystal structure, I thought, okay, maybe there's a change in reflectivity because it becomes a metal. So I did the resistance measurement and I saw this drop in R and I also saw this change in dr over dt. But my diamonds broke when I was cooling it down. So it's very limited in temperature. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so I said, okay, this is a mod transition. But when I looked again at Merlini's paper, I saw that the iron oxygen distances that they obtained from single crystal diffraction, <coughs> diffraction are more typical for a high spin, low spin transition. So I thought, okay, maybe it's a high spin, low spin, and then a mod transition. Maybe I'm just not seeing this high spin, low spin transition. So I did Moosbauer spectroscopy. And at zero gigapascals, I have this two doublets because there's two crystallographic sites for iron here. And as I compress, they're replaced by two other doublets. But this is room temperature data, and again, it doesn't tell me enough, give me enough information about this. So I did low temperature measurements, and we can see that at low pressures, it's both of these components are high spin. And when I reach this high pressure phase, both of them are uh, non-magnetic. It's in a metallic state. But what I noticed here is, 54 gigapascals, when I have both phases, I have high spin and I have a non-magnetic component. I don't have any sign of low spin there. So if in this coexistence range I don't see any low spin, it means it's not high spin, low spin followed by a mod transition. So the only possible explanation left of how the details agree with the low spin, but every experimental evidence seems to point to a mod transition, is that it's a high spin, low spin transition which closes the Hubbard gap completely and immediately results in a mod transition. And this was, uh, as I showed for bismuth iron oxide, it, it occurred within 10 to 15 gigapascals, these two transitions. So this was the first experimental case where both of these transitions were reported to occur at the same time. And it was theoretically predicted for manganese oxide at about 100 gigapascals, but Experimentally, it was shown that the high spin, low spin actually happens at 40 gigapascals, whereas the insulator metal transition at 105 gigapascals. Now, an even more interesting case, in my opinion, is this case of hematite. But there were many studies about hematite previously, and there was still a lot of controversy about it. And that is why I got into it a bit. And here I'm going to show you that I have a two-stage mod insulator metal transition. And of course, from this, I won't expect you to believe it, but wait until the next few slides. But what we can see here is that we have this drop in resistance, and we have a change in sign of dr over dt, and this happens at about 50 gigapascals. And if we look here in the inset, we can see that there is a further drop between 60 and 75 gigapascals in the resistance. Now, I know this is not convincing. It's a very small change here, about a factor of two maybe. But let me show you some more evidence. So this is Moosebauer spectroscopy. And here we have the hematite phase just before the transition. It's still high spin. Here we have what I'm calling now a DPV phase, which will make a bit more sense in the next slide. And we see here that this new phase has two components. One has a sextet, but it's smaller than this one in the separation in the hyperfine field. And the second component is a doublet. And when I cool it down, the doublet remains a doublet. So I know that half of my iron is in a metallic state. The other half is high spin because when I cool it down, I have the full expected uh, hyperfine field of a high spin state. So it just means that the ordering temperature is a bit lower for this high spin component, but the other component is metallic. So I know that half of my iron is metallic and half is not. So first of all, it makes sense that uh, there could be a second stage to this transition. And indeed, when I compress it further at above 75 gigapascals, I'm left with only a doublet and 
when I cool it down, I still have this, just this doublet. So this is, again, proof that I have a two-stage transition. High spin becomes non-magnetic in two different steps. If we look at the crystal structure, we can understand why this is happening. So we start out with these red squares for the hematite phase. And in hematite phase, we have just one site for iron. It's an octahedral site with an average iron oxygen distance of about 1.9 Ansmans. Then we obtain this uh, DPV phase. It's a distorted perovskite phase, which actually has three different sites for iron. Two of them are these B prime and B prime prime, and they constitute half of the iron together. The other half of the iron is this A site, and the two B sites are octahedral sites, and this B site is a bicap trigonal prism. It's a higher coordinated site. And we can see the, from these iron oxygen distances that these two B sites have a smaller average distance than in the hematite phase, and this one is larger. And this makes sense why half of the iron can be metallic and half cannot. If the iron oxygen distances are so far away, it cannot be metallic. Then when we further, further compress, we have a new structure, this ABA2 phase. And these are all single crystal data. These two phases are from single crystal data by uh, Bikova et al. Uh, from uh, BGI. And we can see that in this structure, there's, again, only one site for iron. And it has a short average iron-oxygen distance, and it's octahedral. So we can understand that in this first stage of the transition, we have an insular metal transition and collapse of magnetic moment only for half of the iron triglyphs, only those that remain in octahedral sites. And then in the second stage, we have a complete collapse of magnetism. And what is actually surprising here is that is the fact that we have this intermediate state, this intermediate phase here. Because we see that the tendency of iron 3 plus in this pressure range to transition to a metallic state should result in this single octahedral uh, site. But somehow we have this intermediate uh, state which uh, contains higher coordinated iron. And that's the surprising result here. So this is basically a site selective MOS insulator metal transition that only iron 3 plus and octahedral sites undergoes this transition. Now, is it a gen more general concept? Can we find other examples? We thought of a few, for instance, ferric pulse spinels, which have this calcium titanium type structure, which also has iron and octahedral sites and in higher coordinated sites. And we also th thought about these uh, high pressure phases in manganese oxide, chromium oxide, and titanium oxide. And of course, I chose to study these for ferric post spinels because I was able to do Musbar on them. And those were the only examples with these structures that have iron in them. So I studied a few of them. And here's an example of two, magnesium iron oxide and zinc iron oxide. And it was well known that they transition to this calcium titanium type structure or, or a similar structure at about 25 to 40 gigapascals, depending on which uh, ferric spinel. But what wasn't reported previously is that there is a deviation from standard compressibility at about 45 to 60. You can see that there's like this drop here and here. And in this one, we reach high enough pressure so we can see that it's about 4% difference. And from the single crystal data, we know that not only is it really this calcium titanium type structure and not one of the other proposed structures, but also we know that indeed the iron is sitting in both sixfold and eightfold sites. And when we look at Moosebauer data, uh, we start out with magnesium iron oxide, which is an inverse spinel. So starting out, it has iron in fourfold and sixfold coordinated sites. We increase pressure. These two sites that were high spin and had magnetic ordering even at uh, ambient conditions, when we increase pressure, we see that at room temperature, it's only two doublets. For zinc iron oxide, it's a bit simpler at ambient conditions. It's only one site because it's a normal spinel. All of the iron is in six-fold coordinated sites. And when we compress, again, we see that uh, we have these two doublets. So even when we start out with 
uh, iron only in six fold, as in zinc iron oxide. In the high pressure phase, iron is in two different sites because we can see that we have two different doublets here. Now, if we look at the high pressure and low temperature data, so for magnesium iron oxide at 47 gigapascals, actually both of these sites are high spin. We cool it down, we see two sextet. But at 85 gigapascals, when we cool it down, one is a sextet and one is a pretty broad doublet. And this is another manifestation of a low spin state. Instead of retaining the properties of the original doublet, you get a very broad doublet. And so we understand that iron three plus in uh, octahedral sites is now in a low spin state and not in a high spin state anymore. And only the iron three plus in the higher coordinated site is still high spin. Very similar for zinc iron oxide, again at 47 gigapascals, both of these are actually high spin. When we cool it down, we can see the sextet. At 88 gigapascals, one is high spin and one shows this very broad feature, with it, which is paramagnetic relaxation. It's another different manifestation of a low spin state when doing with power spectroscopy. If we look at resistance data, just to show you that it's not an insulator metal transition, we can see we have this drop in resistance in both cases, but we don't see a change in the slope. DR over DP is negative, even here to 80 gigapascals, and we, we try to extrapolate we see that it should remain insulating to above a megabar. So we know that for both of these cases, we have a high spin, low spin transition, but only for one of the iron sites, only for the octahedral sites. Another interesting case, which is also uh, ferrox for now, is this iron 304 magnetite. But this one is a bit more complicated because we also have iron 2 plus here. Again, from the faction data at lower pressures, it was well known that there is a structural phase transition here at about 25, 30 gigapascals. And we do see again between 45 and 60 gigapascals, this changes in this compressibility here. But we see some more changes, about 70, 80 here, a sharper drop, and again above 100. So on the one hand, it's similar to the other spinels, but on the other hand, it's a bit different. And uh, as I said, it's because of the iron 2 plus. And if we look at the Moosbauer spectra, it's a bit complicated, as I said. So we start out, I'm showing here from 55 gigapascals, where we still have three components in high spin. So we have iron 3 plus in the octahedra, iron 3 plus in the higher coordinated site, because this is already the high pressure structure. And we also have iron 2 plus which is high spin, but we also start to see uh, another component, which is this low spin iron three plus, similar to what we had in the other spinels. As we compress it further, we see another component appearing here, and this one is non-magnetic iron two plus, and it is known that uh, magnetite undergoes also an insulator metal transition. And now we can explain that this insulator metal transition is because of the iron two plus here. Now, we see here that at 120 gigapascals, we still see a lot of high spin, and we have this low spin here, or maybe it's also already a metallic state for this iron 3 plus in the octahedral sites. We're not sure about that. It's a bit more complicated to determine because of the iron 2 plus there. And we have the iron 2 plus here. And, but when we look here at 82 gigapascals, we have a lot more of this high spin. But this was done uh, using in-house Musbar with nitrogen as a pressure medium. And when we do the in-house moss bar, we're collecting data from all of the sample. And because we're using liquid nitrogen, then we have a lot of uh, pressure gradients there. When we did a synchrotron moss bar using helium pressure medium, even at 85 gigapascals, because we're measuring just from a, an area of about 10 microns on the sample using a synchrotron moss bar, we can actually see that we have one third here, high spin iron three plus, one third here in this uh, low spin iron three, three plus, and one third here in this uh, iron two plus in the non-magnetic. So it's really important to try to do these in good hydrostatic conditions and using a synchrotron source. And this was done at ESRF, where they can do this energy domains uh, synchrotron Moosbauer spectroscopy. And 
Now to another interesting case. It's a sluggish second order high spin low spin transition in lithium iron oxide. And lithium iron oxide is has a distorted, a disordered rock salt uh, structure, which means that lithium and iron are in the same crystallographic site. They're randomly distributed there. And this means that each iron has a different number of next neighbor irons around it. And what we saw is that when we compress it, we start to see this deviation from the normal compressibility. And it's very, very sluggish, and it continues on to higher pressures even. We know that there is no uh, insulator metal transition from the resistance measurements we did. And uh, here you can see the room temperature resistance. We do see a very significant drop in the room temperature resistance, but no change in slope. And what we understood is that this is because uh, irons which are surrounded by more next nearest neighbor irons will undergo this uh, high spin, low spin transition at a higher pressure than those that don't have so many irons next to them. Because the uh, magnetic coupling is much weaker for them. And when we look at the most bar data, uh, we can see that, uh, okay, I'll show here first. Uh, we can see the abundance of the magnetic sextet at 76 gigapascals and 100 gigapascals here. And we see that at 76 gigapascals, uh, when we cool it down, we get about 60%. So 60% of the iron is still in the high spin state, and 100 gigapascals, only about 20%. So we still need to go even above one megabar in order to uh, complete this high spin to low spin transition. And we can see here that actually uh, the, this is the quadruple splitting because we have a distribution here. And that is, again, because each iron has a different environment, so we can't get actually one value for the quadruple splitting because each, for each iron, it is a different value. So we can see here that at 90 Kelvin, uh, it's pretty sharp because none of the irons have magnetic ordering, as you can see. So it's a pretty sharp. But when we cool it down, it becomes pretty broad because some of them start to get magnetic ordering. And it broadens, and this also means that it's a low spin state and not a metallic state, as I showed from the resistance measurements. And I'd like to thank my former colleagues from Tel Aviv University, uh, Moshe Taz Pasternak and Gregory Rosenberg, who were uh, my supervisors there and the other members of the lab. A lot of my collaborators from BGI in Germany, where I worked. Uh, between my master's degree and my PhD, I was working with some of them and continued to collaborate with them. A lot of uh, synchrotron staff at ESRF mostly, but also at DESI and Soleil, where some of this work was done, and my current supervisor, Vitaly, at GSC CARS. And some of these experiments were actually done at GSC CARS, so he was a part of that as well. And thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to Any questions? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, didn't under, I don't understand why you uh, only see a belt break. Why do you call that? Sometimes you, you would find that metallic. Why couldn't they just be here? OK, because I'm iron 3 plus. That's even more hard to tell you. So in iron 3 plus, if it's a spin transition, it's spin half if it's low spin. So that's why I said, for instance, for uh, the case of iron 304, that it's very difficult for me to tell what is non-magnetic and what is low spin there. Because I also have iron 2 plus there, and it makes it much more complicated, and it ruins my whole method, basically. <laughs> it could just be a bit of a reaction. Um, Yes. Uh, so, um, yeah. If I'm in a low spin state, then either I see what I what I showed for iron oxide hydroxide, which is a very small hypofine splitting, or I see this 
power magnetic relaxation, or I see a broadening and an increase in the quadrupole splitting. I should, I should see one of those if I go to 4 Kelvin. Uh, and when we did the synchrotron Nussbaum experiments, we noticed that when we go to 4 Kelvin, we see a broadening. If we go below that, we can actually start to see this paramagnetic relaxation, for instance. So 4 Kelvin, in my experience, is always enough to see some change in the quadrupole splitting to know that if it's a low spin or a non-magnetic component, even if it's only for part of the ion. Okay, so of course there are a few possibilities to fit it. And what we generally do is we have to make it agree between the room temperature and the low temperature measurement. So we try to get if because we have we have our source with the with the sample at low temperatures, then we have to get the isomer shift be exactly the same or almost exactly the same between room temperature and low temperatures. And if we can do that, then we assume that our fit is at least, in that regard, okay. We also have to agree with what diffraction tells us, how many sites we should have. And if uh, we have different coordinated sites, that the isomer shift should be different for different coordination numbers because of the different iron oxygen distances. And in these cases, at least, we saw that it agrees. For the magnetite, it's because of the iron 2 plus, it's a bit more complicated to say that it's perfect, but for the other two spinels and for hematite, it completely agrees with the diffraction data and between room temperature and low temperature. Yeah. Mm, sorry? No, I, these samples I did not heat at all. These were all room temperature and cooling down. There was no heating in this process. Okay, very sophisticated. Okay. Okay, so um, do you have any cases, that, and you may have shown them in there, but uh, uh, where you actually have the PT uh, 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 curve for uh, one of these um, high spin, low spin transition mapped um, out? Did you? I, I'm I interested because if you do, then you could get the, uh, if you know the change in volume, you could get the change in entropy and compare it with what people are using to estimate the entropy for these transitions, which I'm not sure if mm -hmm. it's right or not, but you would be able to hmm. determine it experimentally. So I'm just wondering if you have a well-constrained uh, labyrinth slope for any of the transitions. Um, no. I mean, you mean for Mosbauer? Well, for many of the methods you use. I, I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen, you know, selected Yeah, I think really well defined, uh, I think the most uh, extensive one we had, at least when I was there, was for this gallium iron oxide, which was a project by m one of my former colleagues. I, w I took just a part in this X-ray diffraction data there. And even then, it wasn't enough to get a complete map, because each one of those spectra takes at least one day from the moose bar, so doing it at so many temperatures and pressures, it's not really feasible. I think with the, uh, the synchrotron moose bar now, it's possible to do something like that. If you use a membrane cell, you, you can probably do it in one experiment, do something like really map it out. And yeah, I mean, you don't need a PT. Mm -hmm. Oh, but in order to find really the temperature at which it happens, it's you, you need to search for it. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I think we, we for this gallium iron oxide, the only thing that we showed is that actually you could kind of see it in the spectra I showed, is that the kneel temperature was going up, and then suddenly it dropped down, I mean, to not to zero. But it was going up, and it reached very near room temperature. And that's the part we saw that it's easier to show that it's close to room temperature, because then we can just use liquid nitrogen. It's much less of a waste. So 
that was the only thing that really extensive that we did during my time there. Yeah, yeah I'm very. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. So, I'm very impressed by the quality of your power data. Normal talking to me and how point out the weaknesses. <laughs> I have a question concerning AP203. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that they're going to there is a two-stage transition or something, right? Yeah. So in, 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 in the int intermediate stage, is it metallic state or not? It's metallic there. I mean, half of the iron is metallic, so it's enough for the whole sample to behave like a metal. Any more questions? Mm, sorry? I Sky like a FTO as for this type of laziness. Um, so I haven't done any work on FTO. I know that the group previously did some work on FTO, but I, I was focused on Iron Three Plus, and that's why I didn't really get into that. But do you have any specific question about that? Maybe. Victor couldn't attend. Any more questions? Yeah. Actually, one more comment I wanted to make. So. Beyond this Iron 203, where I showed that the two stages of tran the transition, in the other cases the, of the spinels, I showed you the first part of the transition. Basically, there's still high spin there, and probably we need to go to much higher pressures to get rid of this high spin, either by creating a metal or continuing this slow spin transition by uh, changing the crystal structure to something that has only octahedral sites. So it's something to work on if you're interested. <laughs> All right. So, thank you very much again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> we have lunch now, so good lunch. <laughs>